attend to my words, O Lord. Consider my sign. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God, for I put before to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning I lay my requests before you and wait in expectation. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all that who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord abhors. But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house. In reverence, I will bow down towards your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight your way before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with destruction. Their throat is an empty grave. With their tongue they speak deceit. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless righteousness. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. <clears throat> to uh, be sure, the psalm, the words uh, you just heard this morning, they address how we might deal with difficult situations. And in particular, discouragement. Anybody here ever suffer from discouragement? Huh? Anybody suffering from discouragement right now? Okay, I don't mean because I'm preaching and you're discouraged. <laughs> But we do, we, we struggle with discouragement for human right. David is the author of this particular song. And we understand and realize that, that uh, David had a lot of triumphs in his life, right? They're pretty well documented in the Bible. But, but, but he also had failures. And they're pretty well documented as well in Scripture. Yes, he was a man after God's own heart. But he had many struggles. He had a lot of struggles along the way. Some of them were self-inflicted. To be sure, some were self-inflicted. But there were others that were caused by, by people who, who just wanted to see him fail. Some who wanted to see him die. Obviously, these would be painful episodes in his life. Obviously, they would be very discouraging for anyone, let alone God's chosen key. And as we listen to the text, as we listen to the scripture this morning, it seems pretty clear that as this song is written by David. He is presently going through a painful and discouraging episode. That is at the epicenter of this song. That is very prevalent as, and easy to see as we, as we listen to the words. Now, last week, we, we said that through the song, the song that was written, we can learn a lot about compromise. I believe that today, through this song, from this wonderful Old Testament hymnal, Psalm number five. We can learn a lot about dealing with discouragement since we've already determined that most all of us, if not all of us, deal with discouragement. It becomes a very significant passage of scripture for you and I. And, and um, David clearly is down, right? When, when you hear, you kind of sense that in his words, he is down. But he was not out. He was down but not out. And that's a common thread throughout God's word. Those who are down but not out. I mean, think about it. Even Jesus was, was, was down. He seemed to be out until he wasn't, right? Until he rose from the dead. The fact of the matter is that being down but not out is very common. It's very common in our lives. It happens all the time. Some of you may be football fans. The Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl last week. For three consecutive postseason games, they seemed to be down and out. But they were not out, right? They came back from double-digit deficits. Every one of them, they were down, but not out. And now they are the world's champions, at least until next year when the Pittsburgh Steelers dethrone them <laughs> and take over their crown. 
But the fact of the matter is beaten down, but not out as a common thief. We see it in movies all the time, right? I could ask you, can you think of any movies? But I, thought, I thought maybe I'd just limit it to like Disney movies, right? Let's limit it to, can you think of any down but not out characters in Disney movies? How about Snow White? You're down, but not out. Ariel, down but not out. Pinocchio, down but not out. Well, not to mention The Beast, both down but not out. Aladdin, as well as every character in that movie, not named Jafar, down but not out. <laughs> Anna, Elsa, Simba, Dumbo, Cinderella, Nemo, Peter Pan, Buzz Lightyear, Woody, Dory, Mike and Sully, and Ratatouille, all seemingly down, but not out for the count, right? The scourge, for sure. They, were, they would have been discouraged in the midst of those times. They were down, but they were not out. And you might ask, well, why is that such a common theme? Why? Well, because art oftentimes imitates life. And life is full of ups and downs. Let's be honest. So, you know, yeah, even for believers, maybe especially for believers, you and I, we face discouraging times. We just do. It's a fact of life, and we face them over and over again. But as Christians, what we always need to remember is this. We may be down, but we are never out. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect upon your holy word, let it speak to us, Lord, in, in new ways. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, let us not only hear the words you've set before us, Help us understand and then apply them to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. As I said, we continue our journey. We're going to spend several weeks in the, in the Psalms, in these songs from the Old Testament. Um, and, and I've got to tell you, I, I think it's significant. Because I, I believe truly that, 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 uh, that listening to music can be very therapeutic. We talked about this a little last week. Jennifer agreed. She told me that. She said, especially if they're appearing at Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock. But that's a topic for another day. Um, as for me, I have shared this before. Christmas music is always my go-to. You know, when I'm discouraged, when I'm down, I, it could be July, and I'll be going down the road, window down, listening to, I don't know, some, some, some special Christmas album that, that, that uh, just lifts my heart up. And it, it encourages me. I think mostly because Christmas music reminds me that I'm never alone. Right? My Emmanuel is with me all the time. And it reminds me how much my God loves me. So it's not uncommon for me to listen to Christmas music. But today's song, David's song, is a song that also I think can help us when we are in the midst of discouraging times. As I said earlier, it is clear. It is clear from the very beginning that David is, is discouraged. He is discouraged in this song. Uh, and based on his approach, you know, it, it becomes clear to me at least that, 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 that uh, this is sort of David's way of dealing with discouragement. What he lays out before us in this, in this psalm is sort of his coping mechanism, if you will. And, 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 and as we now will take a little closer look, I think we can see several things that become part of his coping mechanism. This, 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 and we begin with a plea, right? He begins with a plea. What do we see in this plea? Well, first of all, we see and we take notice that it takes place during when? What time of day? In the morning. He is praying to his God first thing in the morning. Why morning? I mean, why morning? I mean, why not get a shower, have some coffee, get to the office, handle the important stuff, then maybe around lunchtime, turn to God, right? Why, why not that? I mean, even if I say that, I won't lie. I mean, it, it makes me think to myself, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense, does it? To wait till noon or later to turn to God? I mean, if you trust that God hears all your prayers, and you trust that he's going to answer you. And especially in times when you are feeling discouraged, why would you wait until the middle of the day to get him involved? Does that make any sense at all? You're going to wait until the new time? I mean, I get it. The bed feels cozy, right? It, it feels awful, especially this time of year. The alarm goes off. 
and, and uh, you know, it, it is just so easy to say, Alexa, reset my alarm for 15 minutes from now. You don't even have to open your eyes to, to hit the pause button anymore. Reset my alarm for But let me ask you, what do you gain from that 15 minutes of extra sleep? I mean, compared to what you would gain by turning to your God and, and, and spending time with Him. It can make all the difference in the world if you start your day off praying to God. And I know you're busy, too. I, I get that. You know, you got to get a head start on the day. But here's what Martin Luther said about that. Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Right? I get so much, I'm going to the first three hours in prayer. Because he knows that that's the most important part of what he has to do that day. And then once he does that, God will order his steps. And God will prioritize what he needs to do. God will, God will handle it. I mean, the first thing I notice in this plea that David is making it says it takes place in the morning. He says, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you. You see, I, I, and I, I love the way, Gloria, it's, it's wonderful to hear. I love the uh, NRSV uh, translation she put on the cover here. I love the way it's said there. I, I didn't see this in my prayer, but I saw it when I came in this morning. Oh, Lord, in the morning, you hear my voice. In the morning, I plead my case to you. What better way to start off the day than that, right? See, David refuses to stumble about. He's not going to sort of stoop over and drag behind him all his burdens that he is carrying. He's not going to carry those behind him all day long. And I know none of you ever do that either, right? You don't carry those burdens long as the day goes on. Nobody does that, right? But David, he took his needs to the Lord first thing in the morning. First thing. Oh, and by the way, if you need another example, I don't know, you might go to Jesus. Right? Was it not his his practice to go out and spend time with his father? Oftentimes they're early in the morning. It just makes sense. And don't get me wrong, well, I've been praying all day long. I'm not going to dismiss that. We, we ought to pray continuously as Paul tells us to. But if you really trust God, if you, I mean, if you really do, and you think he's going to answer your prayers, you think he can take away that discouragement that you are dealing with, doesn't it just make sense that you, you know, first thing in the morning, you turn to God? First thing. I mean, I'm just saying. Second thing I see in this plea is this. If you listen to the words of David, you know, you can't help but notice that this is somebody who is becoming more and more increasingly discouraged. You, you can hear it in, 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 in the tone of, of, of the language he uses. In the first two verses, we see the plea grow in intensity. He says, listen to my words. Consider my lament, hear my cry for help. I mean, here is somebody who is, who is struggling. Uh, you know, I don't think you can miss it. He, he is sort of spiraling out of control. He's turning to God. It, 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 if you want to fully understand David's discouragement and how he's dealing with it, you've got to recognize the depth of, of his misery that he's going through right now. Try to picture it. Listen to my words. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help. He's a man who's and he's turning but isn't that the way it always goes? The longer the situation goes on, the more discouraged you become, the more intense our discouragement is. But the final thing that we see in his plea is this. He fully anticipates that God is going to intervene. I mean, he, he just trusts it. He, he says, I lay my request before you. I am listing them one by one, and faithfully and eagerly, I am watching for your answer, God. I am watching for you to answer uh, my request here today. I believe that you're going to handle them. And after handing off his troubles to God, I 
after trusting him and telling him that I'm looking for those answers, he then looks forward to what his day is going to look like. The, the potential pitfalls in his day, the people he's going to encounter, conversations he might have, some of them may be troubling. He, he, he sort of weighs that all out. I may ever do that in, in the morning. You just sort of think, all right, got to meet with David Scarpone today. <laughs> God give me great no. <laughs> We do that, don't we? We, we, we do that. We, we sort of lay out our days. Um, and, and, and he sort of does that. But, but I want you to take notice of, of, of what he does first. Even as he's looking forward to, to what lay ahead that day, and maybe the troubles. He's already made his plea before God. He's already told God, I'm watching for your answers. I trust you. I believe you're going to answer my, my, my plea here. Uh, then he begins looking ahead by contemplating the attributes of his God. We, we see this in, in verses 4 to 6. He, he mentions seven significant things about his God in these two verses. I want you to listen again. See if you can pick all seven of them up. Hey, listen to one that says, For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful. Uh, you destroy the test. Did you get all seven? One. Okay. Did you get five? Did you get four? Four. Four. I got a four back. There you go. Thank you for your honesty, Michelle. The rest of them got less, obviously, because nobody has <laughs> One, his God, meaning our God takes no pleasure in wickedness. Two, no evil can remain with his God. Three, the arrogant, those who boast cannot stand in God's presence. Four, his God hates those who openly and willfully sin. Five, his God destroys those who lie. Six and seven, his God abhors murderers and deceivers. Why would he be reflecting on these things? Why reflect on the attributes of God? I believe it's truly therapeutic for us to do that. When we wake up, think about our God. Think about who He is. Think about, about what, what, what He is capable of doing. Right? Because I think that helps us get through the day. Helps us relieve the discouragement that we might be facing. I, I really think it's therapeutic. Um, you know, it's also comforting to know that our enemies very well what may be enemies of God. Right? And that He's far more qualified to handle those situations and those enemies and we are. So I would ask how often do you start off your day just thinking about how awesome God is? How often do you start your day off that way? You know, just, just you made maybe you made your pleas to God and told him uh, you know what, what lies ahead. How often do you think, God, you are awesome. God, there is nothing too hard for you. How often do you think those thoughts? God, you are amazing, full of grace, full of love. You got my back day and night, 24 7 How often do you contemplate those? Because I think when we contemplate those things, it helps to take away our discouragement. Even as we tell God our needs, it helps to take it away and help us get through, you know, the day. Helps take away that discouragement. And not just in the morning. We ought to be thinking about those things all day long, right? Got a tough meeting today. God, I know you're there. I know you're with me 24 7. I know you got my back. I know you got this. See, there's comfort in that. That's therapeutic to say, God, I got a God worship a God who nothing is too hard for. Nothing at all. And he's with me all the time. To think about how much he loves us. I mean, you've got to make you feel better about whatever situation you're in if you just contemplate the God that we worship and the God that, 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 that we, we serve. And in short, focusing on God's character, I believe, will help chase away discouragement in our lives. Now, he has made his plea, right? He has made his plea. He is reflecting now upon his awesome God. Then David turns his thoughts to himself. He's going to contemplate um, 
look inwardly and contemplate who he is and, and what he does and how he should respond. And, and uh, he, he turns inward. Uh, David does this. I think at some level it con contrasts himself from the people we just talked about, right? They, because um, as, as he enters into it, he says, but as for me, um, you know, sort of contrasting himself from the people that God's going to destroy. You know, that's, that's sort of comforting to think, well, yeah, there are the people you're going to destroy. My enemies are your enemies. Um, and, but, but also, I think there is um, comfort in us remembering that it is only by God's grace, only by his grace and through his atoning death that you and I, we, we have been grafted into his family and that there is nothing he won't do for us. You know, that's, that's, that's us, who we are. We are saved. We are members of his family. And that no matter how bad things get, um, that we'll never forget the words that Paul proclaims in Romans chapter 8 when he says, if God is for us, who be against us? We are more than conquerors, right? And that's a big deal. But, but to me, the, the, the biggest deal here, the, the biggest point that David seems to uh, rest on here is... Um, Found in verse number eight. The greatest part of his prayer. He continues to reflect upon himself and he says, Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. What do you say there? I, I think in essence David is saying, God, I don't want to resort to the behavior of my enemies. Don't let me respond in life. The way they act. I'm reminded of, of the words of George Bernard Shaw. He said, long ago I learned, never wrestle with a pig. <laughs> you get dirty, and besides, the pig likes it. <laughs> right? David says, I pray that you would lead me in your ways, God. Uh, as I go through this conflict, as I go through this difficult situation, whatever I have to deal with, I pray that I respond the way you would want me to, in your righteousness, God. You know, when, when we are uh, discouraged, and it really doesn't matter how we get there, right? When we are discouraged, what I'm going to tell you is that, that, that almost certainly Satan is going to be in the center of that, right? He's going to be right there. And he wants to tempt us to either take the easy way out or the vindictive way of, of responding. You know, that, that's what Satan does. And he'll tell us, just go ahead and respond. Just do it. You know, if, if you're discouraged about a financial crisis, go ahead and fudge on your taxes. Everybody does it. Is that God's way? No. But, but that's, that's an out, right? And if you, if you are uh, discouraged because someone is uh, something that is totally untrue about you, and maybe it's caused you to lose friends. <laughs> Satan says, go ahead, make up something about that person. Go ahead, whether it's true or not, just make it up. Go ahead, get even. Someone at work takes all the credit for something you have done, right? Ever had that happen? Somebody takes all the credit. You, you did all the work, they get all the credit. And they get a promotion, and they get all, all these accolades. And, and, and you become discouraged. And so Satan says, well, why don't you just... Say something bad about them. Why don't you throw them under the bus? Or get even any way you can. See, that, that's not God's way. God never says get even any way you can. God, God never says get down in the mud and wrestle with the pig. That's not God's way. God would never do that. And we need to pray because the temptation will always be there to do that. It'll be there. We need to pray, God, I want to do this your way. I want to respond in a way that would honor you, God. In your righteousness, let me be righteous also. See, when we're discouraged, Satan's going to come call him. Trust him, he's going to. So we need to pray that we will respond in those situations in a way that's pleasing to God. That, that, that we would not respond in a worldly manner, but in God's righteous manner, in his way. That's, you know, David's prayer. That, it is, and I think that should be ours also. Next, David describes his enemies. But you can't miss that he then deliberately and almost immediately hands those enemies over to God to deal with. He doesn't have to deal with them himself. 
He trusts that God is going to handle this situation, including his enemies. God's going to handle it. His sovereignty, God will take care of it. He simply asks God, if you look at the words, he says, let, let them fall by their own devices. Pretty much says, this is what fall. You know, you and I would be wise to do likewise. Maybe you remember how Paul put it in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 to 19. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. Do not take revenge. Do not take revenge. My dear friends, leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. It's not our job. Right? I know we're discouraged. I know we've been hurt. I know the, the situation is difficult. But trust in God. God's got this. The bottom line is this discouragement is always eased. Our burden is light when we focus on God fighting our battles for us. And not trying to fight them by ourselves. And finally, verse number 11. David describes the righteous. He says, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may rejoice in you. And the message to me, at least, seems like uh, that when we do these things that David is doing, this example that he has set before us, when, when we are making our plea to God, we're doing it early in the morning, we're trusting God to have our backs and we reflect on all the attributes of God and, and how awesome He is. And we pray for guidance in our how we handle the situation, uh, the, the hardship that might lie ahead. When we turn all of our burdens over to God, including our enemies, really, what ought to happen is that discouragement that, that is washing over us will be washed away and replaced by joy. That's what David's saying. I ought to be replaced by joy when we think about our God and how he's got this. You see, we need to remember, remember, remember. We may be down, but with God on our side, we will never, ever be out. That's <coughs> Father, as we uh, reflect upon your promises, we are overwhelmed by your grace and mercy, by your love that you have for us. Lord, we, we face this hurt over and over again. But Lord, let us, first and foremost, learn to depend on you and to trust you. Lord, lead us in your paths of righteousness in these situations where we need to address others. That as we go through these dealings, these difficult times, these discouraging times, Lord, that they might be washed away by your grace and mercy and your presence. 